Hello, it's Elizabeth. I've been getting questions from people about when did my interest in seatbelt enforcement began. And earlier today, someone from church asked me that question. And of course, I had to give a brief answer, but I would like to go into detail to tell you. First, I would like to start off with a non-seatbelt situation to help me explain where I'm coming from. In December 1997, my paternal grandmother was walking home and she got hit by a car and she was not crossing at an intersection. And from what I have heard, in order for her to have crossed at the intersection, it would have been quite a long walk because it was quite a big block. Unfortunately, on our end, there were no criminal charges um, filed for the driver. My grandfather started a civil lawsuit and that did not go well. The driver who hit my grandmother was not legally convicted in the death of my grandmother. Even if my grandmother won the lawsuit, that would not change the fact that my grandmother died. Even if she was hit at the intersection, that would not change the reality of her death. Whether or not she was crossing legally or not would not change the reality of her death. The only thing I found comfort in was that the medical examiner believed she died so instantly that she suffered no pain. However, I am sad I did not get to know her like I got to know my other grandparents as I grew up. Prior to 1999, on my way to school with Dad, a cab cut us off at an intersection within three blocks of our home. We were going less than 20 miles per hour. I was not really comfortable with my seatbelt at the time due to my tactile sensory issues and at the time I was not yet diagnosed with Asperger's Syndrome. So anyways, when my dad had to slam the brakes, I felt the tug of the seatbelt. Again, I was on my way to school and my backpack flew in between the two front seats. And that morning I was persuaded to wear my seatbelt. That night when I came home for dinner, my mom said if had I not been wearing my seatbelt, I would have been like that backpack and become a human projectile. Prior to 2001, a friend of mine and I were riding in the back seat of his mom's car. His mom took her attention away from the road to attend to something in a bag next to her. We were going less than 30 miles per hour. We were within three miles from home. As a result of her taking her attention away from the road, we had hit a parked car. Upon impact, I could feel the tug of the seatbelt keep me back. One time after a Nationals baseball game, I was riding with some friends and we were dropping off two people at the metro station. And I was sitting in the back seat on someone's lap. Now, when all of us were wearing our own seatbelts after dropping off at the metro station, I felt relieved. Now, to avoid any embarrassment on anybody else's part, I am not going to tell you who the driver was, and I'm not going to tell you when this was. One time, I was with some friends who were in town for a convention, and this was in the summer of 2007. I was showing them the tourist sites of the National Mall, I then suggested we go to a hotel to call for a cab that could accommodate the five of us, such as a minivan, 
or some other large SUV. Now, we turned out riding a sedan, and the taxi driver said he could take all five of us. This friend of mine, she was seated on someone else's lap in the back seat. I was sitting in the front seat. The whole time, I was praying we would arrive safely. According to the National Safety Council Defensive Driving Course that I, that I take each year, accidents occur within 20 to 30 miles from home, and a good portion of collisions occur at intersections. Growing up, my parents always reminded me to put on my seatbelt. In someone else's car, New York City taxis and limousines, I was wearing my seatbelts. Even when we were in Utah at the ski lodge, I was always wearing my seatbelt in the van that was shuttling us back and forth between the ski slopes and our lodge. Now, I started driving for Uber in April 2015. I am doing Uber and Lyft to help pay for the car that I'm financing, a nice Toyota Corolla, and for the routine maintenance and repairs and the monthly payments and the auto insurance. It was only a week later after I started driving for Uber that I realized my passengers were not wearing their seatbelt. <coughs> Now, let me backtrack for a moment. Beginning in October 2013, the calendar year in which I graduated from college, I began working with adults with developmental disabilities and differences, and for them being reminded to and putting on their seatbelts was their routine. And this was the first time I actually started driving when there were other people in the car with the exclusion of my dad going back and forth between college and during driving instruction, LOL. One excuse I have heard is that people think it is different when they are paying for a ride. Somehow the, there may be more safety. Now, if that were true, then there would never ever be any accidents with school buses or commercial airlines and Princess Diana of Wales, along with Nobel Prize winning mathematician John Nash, would still be alive. Another excuse is that the ride is short distance. Another is a broken arm in a cast or some other medical excuse as to become a human missile in the car. I'd like to remind you of the two incidences I told you about where seatbelts protected me from becoming a human missile. A special note about people with medical situations. Yes, I do recognize that there are exemption laws that exist where a person needs to hold a letter written by a physician explaining why they cannot wear a seatbelt. I would like to mention that there are paratransit companies that are trained in transporting people with medical conditions where a seatbelt would cause a challenge. Yes, the law may grant an exception, but the law was involved with my grandmother's death, and did that change the reality? No. I work in the disabilities field. I understand that people have medical needs, but it is important to find a legal but equally safe alternative for everyone in the vehicle. No one has asked me this specifically, and I do not have a personal official position on this. At the time of this video, I have not researched the safety of unrestrained pets in cars. I have not researched the legal aspects either. However, as a former pet owner, I do understand that the bond you establish with your pets can be very strong and equally strong as with fellow human beings. With that said, I encourage you to take the same safety considerations with your pets as you would with a fellow human in the car. Here are some statistics on seatbelts. According to a WebMD article, 
data from the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration, published in a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, for someone in the front wearing a seatbelt, the risk of death rose by 20% if someone behind them was unrestrained. For a restrained passenger in the rear seat, the risk of death increased by 22% if someone in front of them was unrestrained. And for someone with a seatbelt on one side of the car, the risk of death rose by 15% if someone in the same seat row was unrestrained. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, 50% of backseat passenger vehicle occupants killed in crashes in 2015 were not wearing their seatbelt. In 2015, 58% of passenger vehicle occupants ages 18 to 34 years were not wearing their seatbelts. And from 2010 to 2014, more than half of passenger vehicle occupants killed weren't wearing their seatbelts. I will give you a moment for that to sink in. A lot of my passengers ask me if it's the law to wear their seatbelts. I ask them if they ask the same questions about locking the doors to their homes and cars or that extra lock on the hotel door. You may be familiar with the neighborhood of the hotel, but do you really know what your fellow hotel guests will do? You may know the streets of where you are driving. But do you know what other drivers might do? Do you know if you will have to stop suddenly for an absent-minded pedestrian or another driver? Or an emergency vehicle that can at times appear out of nowhere? Would you think twice about anesthesia being given to you before undergoing surgery? <coughs> Recently, I asked a passenger to put her seatbelt on, as I often wind up doing. She then asked, do you want me to put my seatbelt on? As if I was asking her something outrageous. After she put it on, I took the car out of park and proceeded out of the apartment driveway. I asked her why she did not wear her seatbelt. To paraphrase her excuse, she said she didn't feel it was necessary to wear in the back. I then said, let me show you the laws of physics and I stopped suddenly. I noticed in the rearview mirror that her sunglasses came off her face and she had to pull her hair back so she could see. I asked her, now do you understand? And she said she did as she was catching her breath. I then proceeded out of the apartment driveway. The ride went on and we both established we have family in the Boston metropolitan area. When I dropped her off, I said something along the lines of, stay safe, buckle up, you never know what could happen, and back there, that was just five miles per hour. I won't discuss how I rated her, but I rated her less than five stars, and in an email from for the Lyft driver summary the next day, there was no mention of this. And for those who who may not be aware, with Uber and Lyft, both drivers and passengers rate each other out of five stars. One time I, I picked up two elderly ladies. They were hesitant, but they put their seatbelts on. Two miles into the trip, an ambulance appeared out of nowhere at an intersection, and I had to suddenly stop. I could hear the tug of their seatbelts, I asked them if they were okay and they said yes. I then followed up by asking if they were glad they were wearing their seat belts. Again, they said yes. One time I picked up some university students. I clearly reminded them seat belts. Two intersections later, I looked back in my rear view mirror and I noticed a very clear street behind me and the person in the middle seat not wearing his seat belt. 
So I stopped, not so suddenly, and I say, What part of seatbelt did you not understand? The girl sitting in the front passenger seat, the one with the passenger account, said sorry to me. The car that then a car approaches behind me, slows down, and, and honks the horn. I keep my eyes in my rearview mirror throughout this. I mutter semi audibly, You must have failed physical science class. Other times, riders just refuse, even when I mention the safety. I don't mention the law because if you care more about the law than common sense safety that takes two seconds to do and has been proven by science, I really don't know what to think about that. My passengers, whoever they are, have two options, buckle up or find another way to get to where you are going. Some riders have taken their seatbelt off two blocks or more before their destination. What I do in this case is come to a stop and ask them if they want to get out here. If they say no, I wait for them to buckle up. Depending on their attitude, I become like an elementary school teacher and say, when you put your seatbelt on, that will tell me you are ready to proceed. One time I gave a ride to a paramedic. I asked him if in his own I asked him in his own professional experience how many times has it been when he arrived to the scene of an accident and someone's injuries and or death was a result or direct result of being unrestrained, not wearing a seatbelt. He said at least three times each month. And that is just one paramedic's experience. He went on to tell me that in his line of work, the most dangerous time is not when they arrive at the scene, but the time when they are trying to arrive on the scene in time. To be clear, I always ask nicely and I politely educate. It is usually when people get sassy with me do I reflect the sassiness and attitude back. Like I learned in my counseling classes, mirror the attitude and demeanor of the people you are helping and mirror their body language. I would like to take a moment, I would like you to take a moment to think about the people that care about you and that rely on you, your family, your friends, the people who you see at your religious communities and your faith communities, your coworkers and colleagues, the people you are serving or supporting in your job. Think about a loss you experienced and you thought whether or not the loss or death could have been prevented. Well, I hope I explain my interest and passion in seatbelt enforcement. It is December 2017 and I hope you all stay safe this holiday season. Thank you.